Welcome to today's uh, public lecture. A little while before COVID hit and lockdown, uh, Maggie came to me and said, uh, we're putting together a climate emergency strategic board. Would you help serve on that? And um, I said, yes. And then I said, but who are we going to have working on the board with us? And Maggie rattled off about 20 names and I might have caught one or two of them. And then we started to look at them and we got to one name and it said Richard, Richard Hickson. And Maggie said, he's great. Um, he's a consultant in critical care. We've got to have him on the team. And I said, yes, fine. And then in the first meeting, we introduced ourselves and there wasn't an awful lot initially in that introduction about the NHS. There was a little story about a boy who wanted to be a marine biologist or similar. And I thought, this is very peculiar. And it wasn't until I heard Richard speak that I was able to join together those different bits. So rather than spoil it by telling any more of uh, Richard's story, I'll leave it up to you, Richard. Thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Are the acoustics great? Fantastic, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the invite, real privilege to be here. Um, as John says, my name's Richard Hickson. I'm a critical care consultant. I've had a slightly odd pathway in the last couple of years, and some of this is a little bit of a story about that pathway, but it culminates very much in actions because we, we haven't got a lot of time. We have to be delivering actions urgently with respect to the climate crisis. So hopefully as I talk through this, you kind of see the evolution of this pathway that I've taken and uh, the, 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 the jigsaw will start fitting together. So I'm going to talk about how, at the moment, our oceans are being damaged, how for the last 70 years they've been damaged beyond all recognition, how healthcare itself is contributing to that harm and how we have a responsibility as healthcare staff and organisations to try and reduce that harm because I, I truly believe that it is one of the lifelines that we absolutely need to survive. And if we don't do this, we are going to really struggle. So I'm out, this is completely off piece for me. Okay, so this is me over the last two years. I've been locked on a critical care ITU dealing with COVID patients. And we all have a lot of scars from this. It's been a, it has been a, a, a tough time for us all, mostly for, for, for patients and relatives, relatives who haven't been able to be with their patients who have been um, either critically ill or dying. And so it's been a real tough time. So this is what I normally look like, okay? So it's not a pretty sight. You might recognize me, okay? Because uh, you may have seen me before because I have an uncanny resemblance <laughs> to the, the minion, especially when I try and grow my hair, okay? So we could almost be twins. I just need a little bit of jaundice and I'll be there. Whoops. So, when we were in COVID ITU, there is, there is one thing that became completely apparent, and that is, is that we use a lot of stuff. We use about three and a half kilos of single-use plastics per patient per day, if you've got Australia and the US, and there's no reason to believe that the UK is any different. We use about 10 times the, the standard amount of energy per patient every single day as we're doing our daily lives. So we're, we're, critical care is energy intensive, it's consumption intensive, and it produces a lot of waste. I just became interested in where my stuff came from, where it went to when we were finished and the impact of our consumption on the marine environment. Now, this is just a part of the planet that I had an interest in since being a child. I wanted to be a marine biologist. I swear to this day that marine biology and medicine were next to each other on the paper ACA form and I put the tick in the wrong place <laughs> and I happened to apply for medicine accidentally. But my favorite marine animal uh, when I was growing up was this beautiful Yangtze River dolphin. Absolutely stunning. I mean, look at that face. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I found out a few years ago in 2006, it was declared functionally extinct as a result of the development of Yangtze in China and obviously of global trade. And that was on my watch. And I was like, I couldn't get my head around this. You know, a megafauna species going extinct on my watch as a human on this planet. And I couldn't get it out of my head. We all are very, very familiar with the traditional narrative. 
carbon output has increased, CO2 output has increased, and as a result, planetary CO2, atmospheric CO2 has increased as demonstrated on these very familiar healing curves. What I wasn't hearing was that the photosynthetic capacity of the oceans were being overwhelmed. So just like the CO2 was collecting the atmosphere, the ocean photosynthetic capacity was overwhelmed and CO2 was being absorbed by our oceans and oceanic pH was dropping at an unprecedented rate, faster than seen ever before. It is along with global warming, sorry, along with oceanic warming responsible for the death of coral reefs. Um, that's obviously the cause bleach, and then they die and they dissolve within Pacific oceans. And this is happening worldwide as we speak. You know, most of the coral reefs are now unsalvageable. It has been described, oceanic acidification, as global warming's evil, evil twin, or climate, you know, um, climate change's evil twin. And it's described as this because it is often seen that climate change, there might be some reversible elements within there. But within oceanic acidification, it is much harder to reverse, and it is absolutely catastrophic. And yet, it receives less than five percent of the media coverage of its climate change sibling, its atmospheric sibling. End Permian extinction event 250 million years ago showed, showed saw oceanic pH decreasing by similar amounts to what is decreasing now. I mean, we, we've actually seen a 0.1 decrease in pH over 26 years. Sorry, over 150 years. This equates to a 26% rise in hydrogen ion concentration. The end permanent extinction event, the epoch before that, saw similar sorts of ocean acidification, but it is happening now at about 10 times the speed of the end permanent extinction, which saw the disappearance of 96% of all marine species. When I started looking at this, I started noticing this point of acceleration. So where these arrows are, which roughly is about 1950. This is where, you know, our use of carbon or our, our use of fossil fuels really took off. CO2 generation really took off and oceanic pH started dropping. And I just wondered what else was happening at this point in time. And I came to find out that this is a time when there was an exponential rise in the use of container shipping. Now, container shipping is responsible for loss of CO2 output, but about a gigaton a year. So about the same as all aviation but it's more reflective of the fact that human population since 1950 has tripled. We've become massive consumers and the whole globe has become one great global trading village. And healthcare is part of that process. We use stacks and stacks of stuff within healthcare. We are massive consumers. We are an island nation and 80% of our goods come in on container ships. So we are part of this consumption, part of this problem. Since 1950, we've seen an exponential rise in the production of chemicals. I think there's something like 350,000 now licensed for use. Not all of them have had fantastic environmental impact assessments. And of course, being great consumers, we also produce a vast amount of waste. NHS England alone produces about 600,000 tons a year. It is a huge problem. And we don't know what to do with it all. We try very hard to manage this waste, but some of it will always end up in the wrong place. At COP26, I was really lucky to be at COP26, David Attenborough described the last 11,000 years, the Holocene, as this period of climate stability. We have had, since the last glacial re re retreat, we have had very, very stable climate, very, very stable atmospheric CO2, and it has enabled civilization to grow into what it is today. You can't grow into a civilization if your world is constantly shifting. But we have undone that very, very quickly, as shown by that arrow since 1950, and that huge takeoff of atmospheric CO2 as shown in the Helic curve. Now, this period of time also has been given another name, the Great Acceleration. And I know this is a busy slide. On the left, you have um, uh, uh, um, what do you call it? So I knew my mind would go back. Um, socioeconomic features on the left and earth system science features on the right. And if you look at this vertical black line, that is 1950. And every single one of these, as you can see, as we consume more, we affect the planet more. If you plot the number of McDonald's restaurants, it follows the same pathway. Now, atmospheric CO2 
as it rises. It doesn't, it doesn't rise as a smooth line, it oscillates, it goes up and down. And it goes up and down for a very good reason. That is because we, you have about twice the land mass in the Northern Hemisphere, as opposed to the Southern Hemisphere. In springtime, the Northern Hemisphere, it blooms, you get leaves on trees, the earth breathes in through photosynthesis, and in the southern hemisphere and, and in the autumn period, all these leaves fall, they rot, they give off CO2, and photosynthesis slows down. So you have this natural oscillation. And when you look at the background oscillation, and then you look at what is overlaid on top of that, you can see the scale of what we're dealing with. This increase equates to about 17 gigatons of CO2. But the good news is when you look at the background oscillations is that actually during its normal respiratory cycle, the earth breathes in and out a lot more than we add to it. So there is huge mitigation potential within natural systems. And what we're doing, we're obviously overlaying another 17.1 gigatons into the atmosphere. Now that's about half of the CO2 we produce. 25% goes into the land and 25% goes into the oceans. And it's really important to understand what this CO2 is doing to our oceans because the ocean stats are amazing. 70% of the Earth's surface, 97% of the Earth's water, it absorbs 90% of our excess heat and it stores 40 trillion tons of carbon. That's 16 times more than the land and 50 times more than the atmosphere. The oceans give us so much, but it's very, very finely balanced and we are giving it an awful lot of negatives. We return at carbon dioxide, which, well, as I've said, is leading to ocean acidification. We give it the excess heat energy that is in the system. This then amplifies storms and causes all these adverse weather events that we see with increasing frequency. We see agricultural runoff and trophication causing harmful algae blooms at coasts and anoxic zones. We see direct ecosystem destruction through trawling, through seismic testing, um, and through uh, coastal building. We see transfer of non-indigenous species around the world in ship ballast tanks, and the water is taken in by ships to stabilize them when their loads are different. And it has been estimated that up to 10,000 different species in, those, in that ballast tank water that could be transferred halfway around the world. When it gets put into a, a system that cannot deal with those species, then you get direct competition and you can get some serious imbalance in the biodiversity in those target areas. Waste and pollution is, is just a huge issue. It is one that is beyond my comprehension, but one that we have to crack, especially from a healthcare setting, to uh, ensure that we can actually uh, create a healthy ocean environment. And underwater radiated noise is a really important form of pollution because it is something that can, if we get it right, be switched off. We use our eyes. We use our eyes to see where we're going every day. We use them to create a map of where we travel to regularly. Oceanic marine life, they use their ears like we use our eyes. They use their ears to map their environment, to avoid prey, to find their mates. They, and over the last 70 years, they have become increasingly deafened by the noise that we are injecting into our oceanic system. It would be a little bit like blindfolding each and every one of us over just a few decades and expecting us to live our lives, find food, find our mates, or just even survive. And when you start mixing all this traffic with the life that exists within the ocean, and it's often the life in the ocean that misses out. This, this, this blue mark is a blue whale trying to feed off the west coast of Chile. It was being tracked. And these orange lines, they're ships. And this is the blue whale trying to feed whilst avoiding all these ships moving back and forth. Closer to home is the Bay of Biscay, a very, very deep ocean basin. Um, and these, these markers, they're all ships some of which will be delivering our healthcare supplies, but will definitely be delivering what we, uh, uh, what we buy when we hit the, uh, the buy it now button on, on Amazon. And this is an extremely important ecosystem, uh, especially for species like fin whales that, that migrate here to feed and breed and give birth. And when these shared spaces, uh, uh, or when these spaces are shared, uh, new uh, collisions invariably occur. Um, the, this, this is, a tragedy on a number of levels. 
Number one, we don't have many whales, about 1.25 million great whales. Even, even since the 1986 ban on whaling, whaling numbers have not increased to their pre-whaling days because we have an ocean that is full of big ships, lots of noise, they don't mate as effectively, and they're being struck at a rate of about 20,000 a year by these ships, and that's an estimate from the Royal and Dolphin Prince Ocean. These whales, they sequester huge amounts of carbon during their lifetime. They feed on krill, this puts carbon into their bodies, and when they die at the end of their long lives, bowhead whales can live up to 200 years, they sink and they take the carbon with them. They are also ecosystem <coughs> engineers. They fertilize the photic zone of the ocean. They put nitrogen and phosphates into this, surf, into this uh, top 100 meters that fertilizes the ocean and causes phytoplankton to bloom. That's fed upon and starts creating a cycle, ultimately resulting in the whales eating what it produces and then fertilizing the oceans yet again. Whales are few in number, but the phytoplankton at the other end of the spectrum are enormous in number. Over 60% of ocean life is less than one millimeter in diameter. These are Prochlorococcus. They weren't even discovered until 1986. And yet these are the most abundant photosynthesizing organisms in the ocean. These, along with diatoms, which give us our flint, so enabled us to discover fire, and cocolithophores in the bottom left, which uh, create the smell of the ocean. These are carbonate-based. There is about a billion tons of these photosynthesizing organisms in the ocean at any one time. And every eight days, this biomass is replenished. It overturns every eight days. And all the while, it's photosynthesizing and locking away CO2 within these organisms that can be then fed upon by zooplankton, which eat the phytoplankton. And the zooplankton, the small zooplankton, get eaten by the bigger zooplankton. They get eaten by the bigger organisms. And therefore, this carbon remains in the food chain. Whilst these organisms are photosynthesizing, they are producing oxygen, and they produce about 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. So every other breath that we breathe comes from the ocean. So strangely, you know, the lungs of the planet are not in the rainforests. One of the lungs is actually within the ocean. And at night, something truly amazing happens. From the mesopelagic zone, about two, 300 meters down, which contains an enormous amount of biomass, as the sun goes down, all these organisms like copepods, they rise to the surface <coughs> to feed on the phytoplankton. They move a mass of water vertically greater than the moon does through tides and gravitational pull. It is the greatest mass migration on the planet and it happens every single day. They rise up, they feed, they feed on each other, they poo, they die, they fall down towards the ocean floor and they fall down as marine snow. This rain of carbon that goes from the photic zone down through the mesopelagic zone down into the oceans. And this is facilitated by the drag of water through this huge migration that occurs every single night. <coughs> when we start looking at, at uh, carbon fluxes, we see, sorry, I haven't got a pointer here, but basically we put out about nine gigatons of carbon, not CO2, this is now carbon. About four of this ends up in the atmosphere, as I said, roughly about 50% and about three gigatons ends up in the, uh, taken up by trees and soils, and about two by the oceans, give or take. Um, these are big numbers, there's big error margins in all these numbers, you know, um, it, it is hard to pin them down, and if you look at different sources, you get slightly different numbers. But we have lost 50% of oceanic biomass in 70 years since the Great Acceleration. 50% of this photosynthesizing group of organisms. Now just imagine if that 50% was at loss. Maybe this plus two going into the oceans would be plus four. Maybe the plus four in the atmosphere would be a plus two. Maybe global warming wouldn't be quite what it is today. I'm speculating here, but losing 50% of photosynthesizing biomass from the oceans has got to be a bad thing. And I think it warrants further attention as we certainly move forward when we start thinking about solutions. And it's not just the CO2 which impacts upon oceanic biomass. It is all these things. It is the entire ecosystem that impacts upon this biodiversity at this very, very small level. Now, we're not short of imagery. You know, we, when we start looking below the surface of the oceans, we find all sorts of nasty things going on that are anthropogenic. However, what we are short of is media coverage. If you do a search or search in 2020, 
for commonly uh, used uh, terms on the internet, cake actually came up and was reported in the media 10 times more than climate change. Banana bread came up more than photovoltaics and wind power combined. You know, as a species, we have kind of got our priorities just a little bit wrong at the moment. And we have to now, and this is where I start thinking about my employer, how the heck do we get healthcare to care about this and to start driving change? Because it's fine having the narrative, but you've got to deliver the actions. Now, I don't know, you, I don't know about you, but I kind of care about my health and I care about the health of my children and my wife more than I care about my health. You know, that's me as a human. I saw during COVID, a lot of people who cared about their health and a lot of people who cared about the health of the loved ones. COVID almost broke the NHS. I can tell you that as an insider, I was there. We now have a backlog beyond comprehension and people are going to go without what they feel is a reasonable level of healthcare. One virus, one. Climate change, multiple viruses, bacteria, protozoa, heat related illness, malnutrition, war, mental health impacts. COVID is a walk in the park for healthcare compared to what is coming. And we have to make people realize that as a healthcare <coughs> system, we are not going to be able to keep people healthy as we move into this, as climate change progresses. So, okay, depressing bit, hopefully behind us now. Okay, so put down the sharp objects and let's think about some solutions. So container shipping, this is one of the first ones that I kind of came up with. This is the one that started to kind of play on my mind. It produces lots of emissions, a gigaton of CO2 a year. It comes from these really nasty bunker fuels, the bottom sludge at the bottom of the barrel that goes into these big engines that kind of choose all sorts of fuels. I know they're getting better uh, with low sulfur fuels, etc., with their own problems. But you know, if you don't fill your car up with diesel, if you still use diesel, you know, that can really catch the back of your throat. I mean, you look at diesel on the left here, um, it's, it's, it looks positively clean compared to bunker fuels. And shipping emissions at a gigaton mm -hmm. are. CO2 are predicted to double in the next um, 30 years. Also, obviously, with uh, ships, we have um, uh, sulfates and, and nitrates and other particles that matter. Now, the NHS, 62% of, uh, of our carbon output is locked up in our supply chains, and ships are part of that. So for us to become net zero, we have to have net zero supply chains, and that includes net zero ships. So that's where I'm starting to make a link here. We've already discussed underwater radiated noise, etc but also ships produce black carbon. Now this produces air pollution, it's quite short lived fortunately. Um, so we don't kind of suffer with it obviously as a land-based species, but what it does is it actually, when it, when you, it lands on, on snow and ice, you get an albedo effect that absorbs more heat, it melts a bit quicker, exposes the dark sea beneath it, and that absorbs more heat and you get a positive feedback loop. Now the irony here is that as global warming progresses, the Arctic sea, ice, sea roofs open up for more days of the year. So the ships go across the Arctic to cut some days off their transit time, puts more particulate matter into the Arctic, and that speeds up the demise of the Arctic. So we've got this to contend with as well. On a recent um, expedition between uh, Europe and uh, the Caribbean, the Ghost Foundation, two of the team there, Howard and Diane, they were doing phytoplankton surveys right the way across the Atlantic. And they found, I think it was between five and 50 times the number of what looks like black carbon particulate matter within these samples than that they would normally expect within the ocean. So this, and as we'll come to in a second, this is extremely damaging to ocean life. And all this really comes under the umbrella of pollution. Whether it's macro pollution, you know, the plastic we see in the, in the Pacific garbage patch, or these plastic nurdles in this fish, which was uh, off the, uh, the plastic nurdle spill uh, uh, off Sri Lanka. You know, this is all pretty gruesome stuff, but sorry, but um, this all really kind of starts to kind of like come together under this very kind of broad umbrella of pollution, both macro and molecular. And just to give me a break, I've got a two minute video, which um, I was shown at Monaco Ocean Week a couple of weeks ago. And this is the, the ocean floor 200 meters down, just off um, Monaco itself. So anyone who speaks French feel free to listen in.
This particular brand apparently hasn't been sold in France for about 20 years. Just to show the persistence of the, uh, the plastic pollution. Like I said, it's just 2,000 meters down, so extremely difficult to uh, clear these areas. And the one thing that struck me when I saw this is how devoid of life it actually did look. I'm just going to move forward. So, and this is where we start to cut, start to bring what we call molecular pollution into our thinking, because. All, most of the oceanic pollution starts on land, but it's not all pollution that you can see. Our tailpipe emissions, the emissions that come out of incinerators, including medical incinerators, these all go into the atmosphere and obviously into the clouds uh, and ultimately into, into, into our water system and oceans. We then look at things such as sunscreens, um, oxybenzoates, um, it's been estimated, again, by the Ghost Foundation, that we produce about 14 times the amount of oxybenzo sunscreens every year that is required to kill all oceanic life. One chemical, and there's 350,000 registered chemicals we use. PFAs that we use for non-stick coatings for um, uh, flame retardants and water repellents. Uh, they've been found all around the planet in every single you know, spot. Um, and these are linked with multiple problems in both marine and terrestrial species. Pharmaceuticals, you know, um, we give these in abundance in the community and in hospitals. Um, they, a lot of these go into the urine relatively unchanged. Uh, they, and if they are changed, they're changing to active metabolites. These go down our sluices in hospitals, our toilets at home. And, you know, whether it's antimicrobial resistance, um, whether it is, uh, predatory avoidance behavior in salmon, there are all sorts of adverse effects that, that um, uh, occur from, from our use of pharmaceuticals. And, you know, we're, we're convinced and we were convinced at COP26 that, you know, EVs and trees will save the world. Uh, when you look at electric vehicles, they're heavy, their batteries obviously there's a lot of contention over the mining of the, of the, um, uh, of the minerals that go into the batteries, but they're heavy vehicles and the attrition of tires and brakes with these heavy vehicles is significantly greater than their fossil fuel alternatives. So unfortunately, you know, the tire compounds, there aren't many that changed as yet. And, and after single use plastics, tire and brake dust is the next biggest oceanic pollutant of this type. And yet, you know, here we are being sold this new generation of uh, change that will change the world, but it, it may not change it for the better. There may be some unintended, unintended consequences to these moves. And of course, plastic, you know, it is, I mean, you, you don't need me to tell you quite at the scope of the problem here. Uh, the problem is, is that healthcare is utterly dependent on plastic. Um, the good news is two thirds of our healthcare plastic is actually plastic wrapping. So there, there is scope for some change that I would come on to and have no idea what's going on. And the problem with all of these things, these forever chemicals, a lot of them are hydrophobic, they bind to these molecular plastics and, um, uh, and tire dust, and they are literally fed upon by these small organisms, which then die. And this reduction in oceanic biomass that we have seen over the last 70 years, it is thought by a number of groups that this is related more to pollution than CO2. And if we look at the time scale for uh, the loss of all carbonate based marine life, which is right in the center there, that kind of uh, beige circle, um, that is frighteningly soon on the current trajectory of acidification. And just remember the acidification is not just the CO2 going in, it's just the poisoning of marine life at a molecular level um, so that the, uh, we get less in the way of photosynthesis occurring. So just very briefly, um, and um, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but has anyone learned anything over the first half of the talk here? Okay, so there's some lots. So good, that's, that's good, thank God for that. If, if you all said no, then you know, you're all aware of these problems. But lack of awareness is a big, big problem. You know, that we, it's a big problem for climate change within the NHS in general, and we have a pretty active agenda with the net zero uh, climate change uh, program. So because of the lack of understanding of, of oceanic health and risk, we, we um, and there's a couple of us who uh, set up Healthcare Ocean, just a, uh, it's, it's not even an organization, it's a banner to operate under to give us an identity. And we did this in October 2020. 
We tagged onto the, the narrative, the climate emergency is a health emergency. We also said the ocean emergency is a health emergency. Both are a healthcare emergency because we won't be able to deliver healthcare. These are all linked uh, supply chains, our delivery of healthcare, our pollution, they're all linked to the oceans. And we cannot get to net zero without healthy oceans and net zero ships. And we need to educate. And can we educate? Well, in County Durham, we made a climate change module mandatory within the trust, and we get 75% uptake within about four months. So we believe we can educate if we take the right approach. We also had our first joint um, healthcare ocean and Lloyd's register, the shipping register. Uh, article that went out in Lloyd's Register Horizons magazine. So we started to publish in the area of, of healthcare and shipping. But persuading a land-based species, this is important, is really difficult. At COP26, is about trees and EVs. You know, reforest, that will save the day. We have to stop deforesting 23, 25 million hectares worth of uh, trees every year as it stands. So we're always, we're always kind of fighting this with one arm tied behind their back. We've got a lot of kind of, uh, a, a lot to make up before we can have an impact within forests. If we do get our land use right, there is significant potential. But do we have the time for trees to grow? Oceanic biomass doubles every few days, land-based biomass, biomass doubles every 50, 60 years. Do we have the time for the land strategies to actually take effect? I don't think we do. For things such as uh, direct um, air capture, the carbon capture and storage, I'm not an expert on this, I've had a brief look into it, and it looks as though the capacity for these, thank you, somebody shaking their head, the capacity for this to save us is not there, and I would caution against tech-based solutions because in 1979, Jimmy Carter asked his um, uh, government to come up with a solution to the climate or the carbon issue, and they said we had time to technolo technologically adapt. Now, I hate to say it, but you know, that marker there is 1983 when the report was published. I don't think in the last 40 years we've managed to te technologically adapt. And if anything, the buy it now button has probably just accelerated this along with cryptocurrency mining and all the other things that we do. So through Healthcare Ocean, uh, we started focusing on container shipping and our relationship with the shipping industry, waste and pollution from healthcare, how we can raise this as something to challenge within the healthcare environment and education. We can't drive change without education. Now, as a driver over the last couple of years, we've been really lucky. NHS Net Zero came out in October 2022, sorry, 2020, the first health service in the world which committed to Net Zero by 2045, including its whole supply chains. That's very carbon focused. Then, at the same time, policy procurement note 620 came out which gave us the line there, we need to influence suppliers for delivery of the contract to support environmental protection and improvement. We suddenly had nature there at a governmental level for our contractual obligations between our suppliers and providers of healthcare. We suddenly have nature in there. We just have to figure out how to use that line. And we're doing that through our social value guidance, which we are inputting to at the moment as Healthcare Ocean to create um, this, um, uh, this, 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 within this interface between our suppliers and us as providers, we are going to drive that change through the contractual obligations and that procurement process. And we then developed, or then planning to develop, the evergreen supplier framework. It's a little bit like a, a rating system for suppliers. The suppliers engage more and more and more. They go up the framework. The NHS looks upon them more favorably, and we reward those forward thinking suppliers who are addressing areas such as clean shipping, molecular pollution, et cetera. So this is, this is some of the wording that we're using at the moment. So I've had to learn some procurement wording here, some detail how through the delivery of the contract, you reduced wastewater contamination from manufacturing your product. And what this is trying to do is trying to deliver change at source. So change in these countries where there's all sorts of kind of problems, lack of scrutiny and governance within the manufacturing process, but they're going to have to prove that they are tackling pollution at source, not just pollution in the first world country where the healthcare is being delivered. We are driving change by asking these suppliers to deliver their goods with the least environmental impact possible. And we can do that. There are ways to do that through uh, independent, um, independently verified environmental measures 
from groups such as Clean Cargo Working Group, uh, where they can access this data and they can pick the shipping companies that are most ambitious. We are looking for them to invest in nature and biodiversity. And I know this sounds a bit vague, but it is possible. Basically, we do not want them just to kind of, you know, carbon focus. We want them to actually have a focus on creating a healthy planet, because that's what we had 250 years ago. And that's what we've got to recreate or figure out a way of living in that new healthy planet. And they have to be educated just by opening door their doors and being educated in oceanic and human health. That in itself is a positive, as recognised by NH, as hopefully recognised by NHS singles. We're closely aligned with how the UN views, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, with the goals of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, and these four um, goals are really closely aligned to the way that we, we kind of operate at Healthcare Ocean. The result we're hoping, you know, obviously improve fish stocks to feed billions, <coughs> not just a dish for the wealthy. Improve sequestration through blue carbon, increased biodiversity, increased whale numbers that fertilize the photic zone, increased biomass, the phytoplankton, which when it blooms, it blooms in so great a mass it can be seen from space. You know, and that can all happen in a very short space of time. To quote David Attenborough from A Perfect Planet, he said, Phytoplankton is our greatest ally against climate change. The UN Global Compact, again, it's very similar in its, um, in its goals. This is a, a voluntary, uh, non-binding pact, but they too, the UN very much focused on ending waste entering the ocean and also set sail for decarbonized shipping. So now within the UN, we've got this link between decarbonized shipping and the oceans, which is fantastic. On the right here, we've got a, a beautiful video. This is real technology. This is smart marine shipping, the fully automated sail technology, which can be fitted to bulk carriers. This is in the uh, uh, production pipeline as we speak, and this can reduce the carbon cost of shipping by about 20%. This is bulk carriers, not container ships, but it shows what is feasible. And I know we've left the EU, but they have some great vision about what a healthy ocean should look like. And there was a QR code at the end that you can scan, which leads to this web page, which is truly amazing. Very much aligns with exactly what we are uh, doing within Healthcare Ocean. Now, this is all big stuff, and I'll just very quickly do, go through what we are doing locally. As individuals, I like to kind of think that we can approach this through the four Cs. So cars, whatever car you drive, drive it less often. Tire dust is really problematic. Uh, even if you do have an EV, just try and reduce mileage. Uh, choose not to cruise. There is no environmental benefit to cruise ships. I mean, if you look at the one on the screen, you probably just see it on the screen behind there. It's got some nice heavy fuel oil being kind of uh, piped out there into that beautiful fjord. Um, it is not a particularly good way to holiday if you are environmentally conscious. Uh, as a consumer, try and reduce your consumption in general. The buy it now button does fuel global trade. Uh, so you need to think about what we're consuming and chemicals, sunscreens especially. You know, check what's in your sunscreens, try and find those sunscreens that are less uh, polluted. <coughs> what I do when it all gets really overwhelming is I put on my boots, I go to local rivers and I pull the crap out of the river. Uh, because if it's out, they're not in the river, then it's, uh, at least it's uh, one step in the right direction. So I, I, I tend to try and remove what's in the uh, environment on a small scale. It makes me feel better. Um, as healthcare providers, they will very much focus on carbon, but we are saying if you have a green plan and it doesn't include a blue plan, it's not fit for purpose. So we are encouraging all healthcare organisations to, um, uh, to uh, extend their green plans to blue plans and to consider biosphere health within their goals. Within our own organisation, no surprise that we do have oceanic health within, within our green stroke blue plan, um, because I wrote it. Um, and so, you know, we, we have taken that move. We're early days, but very much, you know, um, hopefully it's something we can build upon. And when we look at our plan, you know, had Sue Jakes, our chief exec behind us right from the beginning, get real board level buy-in. We need advanced board level training. We haven't done that yet. Uh, that is in the pipeline. We have an SDG, a sustainability development group, which very much focuses on traditional areas, um, but very important areas. The communication of the challenge is really important, but also the winds so that would decrease our carbon footprint by 41, estates and facilities carbon footprint by 41% in 13 years. So we are winning in, some, winning in some areas, and then you need to network everyone and get that mass effect and get everybody to care. 
We need education for all and we need collaborations. And this is something that came out of COP. We cannot do this alone as a public sector organization. We need to collaborate with the private sector. And we are collaborating with Philips Healthcare, big global organization, in order to deliver change. And you know, when we're thinking about the scale of change, it's huge, it's massive, it's it's beyond our comprehension at the moment. Um, you know, we are going to need to power our hospitals with new renewable energies or piped hydrogen. You know, this is the level of change that we need, and we need it soon, we need it now. Local authorities massively important, all part of this anchor system network, the councils, the universities, you know, help, probably even the football clubs, you know, these are all really important, you know, fixed assets within a region that actually has a vested interest within that region. So within our region, in the integrated care system, we have our sustainability group, which is extremely active, and it is absolutely essential that this, this, this regional group doesn't look into the trusts, but looks very much externally out towards the communities. The lowest carbon healthcare is that which does not need to occur. We need people to be healthier. And we have an education program, the first in the uh, country, in the Northeast of North Cumbria, the Faculty of Sustainable Healthcare Education. And we aim to educate all 64,000 healthcare professionals who then become educators in their own rights. Nationally, we have Greener NHS, they provide a direction. We have charities like the amazing Center for Sustainable Healthcare. We then globally start moving into the World Health Organization. Very much, you know, health is a fundamental right of all. Well, that's a useful line to kind of work on as we move forward. And luckily for us at COP, healthcare had a very, very loud voice. I think the penny was dropping that we can't keep people healthy in a dying world. So we, that is, and that is an amazing driver. So at COP, we had uh, one year after we launched Net Zero, we had about 13 countries join that vision of Net Zero Healthcare, which was amazing. Um, for me, um, the Clydebank Declaration was the highlight. This is forming green shipping corridors. So the first proposed is between Shanghai and Los Angeles. So you're looking at uh, basically zero emission ships with the infrastructure of both ends to support those, sh those high traffic shipping routes. So we're talking green hydrogen, that sort of thing, with the bunker facilities at both ends. We then have COSEF, which is separate to COP. This is from the Aspen Institute, but this is a uh, cargo and owns zero emission vessels. It's got some pretty uh, big industries on there already. I made the connection with the Aspen Institute and I brought them into the NHS. And my plan is that we either have NHS as a signatory for zero emission vessels or our big suppliers. I don't mind which. Um, as long as we get people signing up to zero emission vessels to drive this forward, to show people that healthcare cares about oceanic health and understands the damage that we are causing through procuring and delivering healthcare. And just to kind of finish off, there's one thing that really bugs me, and this is the residuals, because this, there's always, in everything that we do for carbon, there's always this little residual bit at the end, you know, and this is what we're supposed to tech our way out of, research, innovation, technology, etc. Now, the residuals are set based upon success in every other area. And I have to say, I think the scale of what we ask is, is so great, I think there is a risk of slippage. And I think the risk is that the residuals will just grow and this will become a real problem. I think we have to recognize that now so that we can start to think about how we deal with growing residuals. I can't see a way out of this, particularly when we look at all the tech that is out there, if we think of land, tech, and um, oceans. But the one thing that I would say is my money is on phytoplankton. A billion tons every eight days, doubles its biomass every three days, captures huge amounts of carbon, is the source of primary oceanic production that fuels our planet with oxygen, absorbs CO2, and is the basis of the entire marine food chain. Its biomass has decreased by 50% in 17 years, and if we do not turn that around, I haven't got a clue what the solution is. So I personally, have resigned from virtually everything in sustainability that isn't related to the oceans. That's how strongly I feel about this. So I now work uh, at national level with NHS England, with the UK government, with the Monaco Ocean Group, um, and you know, and through Healthcare Ocean. 
And I do believe we need to look at this very, very seriously if we are going to find a way through this crisis. You know, our bodies are two thirds salty water. We came from the oceans. They gave us life. And I think they've got a chance of giving us a second chance of life as we enter this very critical period of the Anthropocene. We always like to say it's the oceans and us, not the oceans for us. We have a bit of a presence online and in social media. And as promised, that if you want to scan that QR code, it leads you to the EU um, webpage, which I think is absolutely fantastic. We couldn't have got here alone. Along the bottom, there are a few of the groups that have really supported us. Um, and uh, we've got a busy few years ahead. But thank you for listening. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Um, let's take some questions or commentary. Ben, fantastic, fantastic talk. Um, packed with staff. So, side question any chance to get hold of your slides? It'll be really good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, two completely different questions. First one is how much of COP15 is going to be about the oceans? And the second question is are you optimistic? Um, and if so, why? <laughs> uh, I don't know how much COP15 is going to go about the oceans. As usual, you know, it is, it is likely it will be, it will fight for airtime, um, which is what it has always done in the past. Um, I hope it has a presence and a good presence. Um, we can just hope. Um, we will keep shouting, of course, and uh, we will keep doing our bit um, to, to try and get it onto the, onto the stage. Um, and I think from a positive note, you know, just 18 months ago, the NHS was not talking about oceanic health. And now in presentations that we're not even at, they start talking about oceanic health and how important it is. So it's, it's, it's creeping in there. Uh, am I optimistic? Um, I think it's a hell of a job. Uh, I really do think it's, uh, um, um, I think if we admit the scale of the challenge, which I don't think we've fully done yet, and I saw that, again, I go back to COP, you know, to talk about EVs and trees as the solution means you don't understand the challenge. Um, you haven't looked into it in enough depth. To not have oceans in every single plan, again, signifies you don't understand the potential. I will be optimistic when we absolutely have complete engagement with the goal of having healthy oceans within our lifespan. That's when I'll become optimistic. Sloan? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll just start with a plug for the Heritage Plug is that if uh, my colleague Pat Apology are launching a new master program in the Heritage Plug, we have. If you're not already in touch with them, I'd love to give you a very exciting new initiative. And my question is about um, specifically about NHS procurement. So I was in a hospital last week for a CT scan and I had for two years and I have a line put in. And I was discussing with the medical person there these the bands that they use to yeah. bring their tower. I was like, you use one of those really nice ones and we took one with you. And she said, Oh yeah, there was so much better now we've got to use these disposable ones. Yeah. I was so angry with them trying to get rid of waste that we've been told to use. And I was thinking, well, you know, surely there's a there's a system behind this and there's a there's everyone complains about procurement. The procurement often will rely on things like decision support um, models and systems. And somewhere in that decision support system, the priorities need to change. And yeah. So I'm interested to hear from you whether that's whether you're looking at that and whether there are ways into those kind of systems that you can shift the balance of yeah. Um, yeah, the priority from one to another. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, typically procurement is, you know, get it quick, get it cheap, um, and tick all the infection control boxes. Um, we've gone to a real extreme on infection control, to, to almost the ridiculous. And, you know, yes, it's important, absolutely, but it's got to be balanced. Um, and that's where your single-use items have come from. Um, with respect to procurement specifically, there are not many clinicians who work in procurement. There isn't, and procurement is a dark art to most physicians. As long as the stuff is there, they don't really care where it comes from. 
and we need to break those barriers down. So yes, we have, procurement is front and center of our sustainability group. Um, so, and I uh, myself engage both with our group regionally and nationally. I sit on NHS England's Sustainable Procurement Forum. So I think we need more clinicians in there to give that voice, um, to give that clinical voice within procurement so that we break away from it being this kind of like um, very stale product focused um, uh, approach and that we uh, actually make it a little more um, um, holistic in the way that we, we procure goods. Um, again, big job to move from single use and to start getting circular economies, repurposing, reusing, uh, keeping stuff in the system rather than just accepting we buy it in and chuck it out. Uh, but we've got to do it. It's, it's a top priority must do. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, Rob. Richard, I'll first up because I work in procurement. Hey. Um, <laughs> great to see PBS 6 I'm obviously the next of strategy as well for the NHS, really setting the bar in globally, actually, in terms of where healthcare providers going, where it's Scandinavian and other providers also moving. Um, the weighting that puts behind that is hugely important. Yes. Uh, well, we're at site on to you know, how that's driving the supplies, but also reflecting slightly defensive procurement, but procurement by what is specified. Yeah. Perhaps, again, that's not the role of the physician, but somewhere in that food chain, and therefore, that is, is the source of the challenge. How, how, do you, how is the NHS addressing what is specified in order to support the right outcomes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, to, to go back to the weighting, because that's the bit I do understand, because I'm involved in this. Um, I think weighting is an odd, odd way to approach planetary health. Mm. I personally think we've got it wrong. I think it should be a sin. I literally think, you know, you've got to have a restriction on what filters through into that purchasing kind of, um, uh, that purchasing layer. And if you do not fulfill certain requirements within your manufacturing, your <coughs> shipping, your materials, your, then you should not fit through that environmental sea. And therefore you shouldn't become part of that, that um, uh, you shouldn't be available to be chosen um, until you've fulfilled those requirements. And then you can get down to price and, and uh, supply and you know, uh, the, the actual, um, um, uh, the other parts that are important within procurement. So that's, that's how I feel personally about weighting. Um, I haven't articulated that out loud before to other groups because NHS England are doing great work with respects to the way that they are introducing these social value within the, the procurement process and the way that they have applied the minimum 10% weighting. So absolute respect to them for doing it, but I think we have to go further okay, than what we're doing. And I think, we, again, we have to probably do that at a speed. And so the second part of your question was? It's about specifying. Yeah. It's procurement that we were specifying, that's through the money, so through the field of care, 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 care conditions, sure. but perhaps not the positions, but as the, as the people with real knowledge, yeah. how do you support the specification of things which are acceptable, which can be purchased sustainably? Yeah, that's going to be a tough one, um, without a doubt. I mean, um, we, number one, we've got to understand the process because it's taken me just a, you know, a couple of years just to understand the very basics of procurement. Um, so from a specification perspective, you know, that's got to be part of the conversation that we're, we're having um, in, in, in uh, whichever sustainability group. Uh, and we've got to, whether that's a national group or that's a local group, to find out how we can, how we can engage with those decision makers on specification. Um, because a lot of this, it's, it's really hard to break into these groups. Um, I've, I've had some dialogue with the CQC. It took me so long just to get through into the Care Quality Commission. I had to guess the email addresses of the people that I wanted to reach based upon yes. suffix. And then I managed to find an email address that works because you couldn't reach these people. And I don't know what it's like with Central, probably with NICE and kind of the other groups, whether or not they're open to dialogue. Um, maybe we should talk about that. So I'm sure you've got some experience. Anyone else? Charlotte? Mm -hmm. and I assume 
not wet from your like internet or your stuff. Yes. So I work for exceptional organization and a good community as well. Is that is there a plan to roll that out? And also could you when you're procuring things from from people, could you be a condition that they take that module and play to their stuff so you yeah. roll it out? To answer the second one, yes, absolutely. I would, I would love that. I think, you know, in order to drive change, we need educated people, people who understand the scale of the problem. And I would write that as part of the uh, uh, the social value guidance. That actually, your staff do have to undertake training in, 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 in healthcare and, and the climate challenge. Um, so yes, absolutely. With respect to the module, now this is really de surprisingly divided, okay? Some people like me, feel that it should be just mandatory, that if you want to practice in healthcare, you've got to undertake these, these, these environmental modules, you must do it. Other people feel that that is uh, unacceptable, unacceptably prescriptive, and we shouldn't make it mandatory. Now, I've thought about this a lot because we, we did make it, it's not quite mandatory, but it's part of the required competency. So if you want to reach 100%, you have to do our module. So people try and reach 100% you know, to their appraisals, so they do our module. The module is um, was developed by the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare and Health Education England. So it's on a central kind of system that we've then loaded into our own local database of education. So people can do it within the trust and we can then trust <coughs> the people have done it. So we've kind of taken the national system and we've embedded it locally and then followed our own pathway. I got some feedback from other trusts in the Northeast who haven't done that. And whereas we've reached thousands of people on taking the module, they can count the numbers on two hands. You know, so I think we need to make it mandatory. And the reason why I justify this is I've been a doctor for 29 years. I have therefore undertaken probably 29 fire safety lectures. <laughs> I have seen one fire in my life. That was in my first week on call in Nottingham where someone set my uncle room on fire. Um, <laughs> Deliberately. Yes. It's so different to you. Explain screen assessments. Is it having a master's level when you're saying you sit to work with medical professionals? Yeah, completely. Absolutely. Well, we what we're what we're doing is um, you know, we um, yes, yeah, so my argument with the fire thing is I've seen one fire in 29 years. Climate change is all around us, you know, so hell, it's going to kill billions. You know, fire in my hospital hopefully will never happen, but won't kill billions, you know. So for me, it's a no brainer. Public sector, absolutely. Um, I don't see why we can't extend this further. I think the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare would be very keen to extend this further. Uh, they've done a wonderful job with their module. We're going to work with them on our oceanic module. Um, and we want our oceanic module to be undertaken by suppliers to the healthcare, the healthcare system. We want it available to the public and we want a version for children. You know, and we want oceanic health to be understood because those images, not everybody Googles these images. You know, you may see them every now and again on TV. Or Other than the banana cake. The banana yeah. cake, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's very well Googled. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the undersea images, people don't see them. You know, not many people look below the surface of the ocean. Um, and therefore we've got this challenge and we have to get this absolutely mainstream. Uh, and that's one of our challenges for 2022. You know, we set that. We, we said we wanted to be on the sofa of, I don't know, Philip and Holly or whatever those programs are, you know, talking about oceanic health, because I think it needs to be that level. Okay. I'm going to try and sum up, if, if I may now. Actually, before I sum up, if there's one group where prescription has a, a positive uh, footprint, it should be you lot, you know, so <laughs> prescription should go down okay. Um, I, I, I think I've heard Richard speak three or four times now, each time, and you have a very well-informed audience here, and unusually, the Energy Institute, our uh, mission statement is all around Net zero. And yet, as you quizzed us about halfway through, did you learn something new? And I put my hand up, as I think the, everyone in the room. Um, I would, th this is a one man mission in Colossus, which has spread uh, not quite virally yet, but you know, the early stages, 1950 rather than perhaps 2010. 
the, the importance of this is so great. Um, the sort of thoughts that struck me when I was uh, sitting further up there is that we should be delivering this as, as part of the induction week of um, the university. I, I think there's a potential to do something like that. So you're talking about modules for children, but this more or less as it stands would work, I hope, um, in our environment too. And it could form, um, they just asked for the slides. Similarly, it could form part of uh, uh, the process we're about to begin in, uh, from this unit of CPD, um, and would marry in quite nicely. And as Charlotte said, again, she could see, Mark feels like the wrong word, an audience for uh, what you're uh, talking about here. It was fantastic, as usual. Uh, you inspire me, and I think you probably inspired everybody in the room. So keep going, and we will back you up. Thank you. Thank you.